Hi, and thanks for being here. Welcome to the Dr. Stephen Show. We have an amazing episode today with Dr. Mark Hyman, director of the Cleveland Clinic Center for Functional Medicine and the chairman of the Institute for Functional Medicine. Mark, thank you for being here. Thanks for having me. I am so excited that you're here today. Your new book, Eat Fat, Get Thin, is just off the charts. I mean, what is the deal with fat? I mean, avocados, right? I mean, best food ever? Is that like... Yeah, well, it, it is pretty good food. I think, you know, I wrote the book because there was so much confusion about fat. I had written about sugar. I had written about food addiction related to starches and sugar and how that affects the brain and the body, the concept of diabetes. But I realized I never tackled the issue of fat. And then when I started thinking about it, I realized, you know, wait a minute, I actually have a fairly superficial understanding of fat. You? I did. I, I mean, I've studied nutrition for 30 years, but I realized how much did I really read the research. So I said, I better go cool. back and look at actually the data, not just what people are saying about the data, but the right. actual data. What about omega-6 fats? What about saturated fat? Does fat make you fat? What about heart disease and fat? These questions are yeah. you know, spinning around in society, and there's so many opposing views. I mean, everybody agrees that we shouldn't be eating sugar and starchy foods. Right. Like, nobody's arguing with so me I about that. So I shouldn't eat Wonder Bread, right? No, I mean. no, no, Wonder Bread, you know. <laughs> you know why they call it Wonder Bread, right? Why? Because somebody ate it once and they go, I wonder if this is bread. <laughs> I mean, my, my rule for bread is if, if you can stand on it, it doesn't squish, then you can eat it. <laughs> But so I, this was one of the hardest books was, you've ever written. It was I hard hear. because, you know, there's so much controversy. There's the low-fat camp that says you should be on an extreme low-fat diet to right. prevent heart disease and live a long life. Yeah. And that you need to eat low-fat to lose weight. And there's other people who are saying we should be, you know, drinking gallons of butter every day. And that's a good thing. So Putting butter in the coffee. Putting butter in the coffee. Coconut oil in the coffee. Yeah, right, yeah. right. So, like, what's the deal? Like, I don't want to be... What's the deal with fat? That's right. What's the deal with fat? So... <laughs> Does fat make you fat? Does fat cause heart disease? Those are really the two biggest Eat questions. Eat fat, get thin. Right. It's about healthy fats. It's about healthy fat. It's about the understanding that food is not just calories, that it's actually information. Yeah. So if, if, if let's just take the fat makes you fat concept. Let's just let's go into that for a minute. Because fat, the concept that fat has more calories mm -hmm. than carbs and protein, has nine versus four, right? right. It's more than twice as many calories. Yeah that if weight loss was about eating less and exercising more, that if you ate less fat, you would lose weight. And that's been the message that's been pushed on America for decades by the right. food industry, by the government, by yeah. the American Nutrition Dietetic Association, by the American Heart Association, American Diabetic Association, everybody's on board with this, yeah. that all calories are the same. Uh -huh. And they go, well, it's just thermodynamics, right? You know, it's yeah. calories in, calories out. Uh, who are you to question physics, right? Well, right. I'm not questioning physics. The first law of thermodynamics holds up, but the definition is all calories are conserved in a system, a yep. closed system. Your body's not a closed system. When you eat food, it goes through your body in form of, of these biochemical reactions that are all dynamic. Your yeah. hormones change, your brain chemistry changes, your microbiome changes, your immune system changes, all with every single bite of food, because food's not just calories, it's information. Cool. And there's different things that happen when you eat different information. So when you eat sugar and starch calories, it turns on a, a switch that drives weight gain. So it right. increases insulin. Mm -hmm. Insulin is the fertilizer for the fat cells. It's the fat storage hormone. Yep. It makes you hungry. It slows your metabolism. And it pulls the fuel out of your bloodstream into your fat cells. So all of a sudden, your body's thinking, wait a minute, fuel gauge goes down. I'm hungry. I shouldn't exercise. So you basically get lazy and hungry when you eat too much sugar. It's like a bear going into hibernation almost. That's right. And so it creates this opposite effect, and it, and it leads to the opposite thing that you want to do. So your body's in a sort of state of starvation. Yeah. The other thing is that when you eat fat, the opposite happens, right? When you eat fat, you don't produce insulin. So think about type 1 diabetics. You're a doctor. You went to medical yes, school. When you have I a type did. 1 diabetic show up, what are the symptoms they get, right? They get polyphagia, polydipsia, and polyuria. It means they, yeah. Polyphagia means they're hungry all the time and, and they're thirsty. eating like crazy they're eating 10,000 calories a day and guess what they're losing weight why because there's no insulin mm -hmm. there's no insulin and insulin without insulin you can't so if you just drank liters of olive oil a day and that's it you <laughs> yeah. would not gain weight you would probably lose weight right so we have to kind of rethink this whole idea that fat makes you fat now it, there's one caveat there if you eat sweet fat sweet fat is starch or sugar and fat that's a bad combo twinkies 
Twinkies, <laughs> donuts, French fries, ice cream, yeah. bagel and butter. You know, I'd rather have the butter than the bagel. Now, I asked once this uh, guy who's the head <laughs> like of the that. Tufts Center for Nutrition, doc, he's a dean of the medical of the, the school there. He says, yeah. Dr. Darius Mazafer, and I said, if you had to choose between a bagel and butter, what would you eat? He says, I would pick the butter. And this is like one of the top researchers in nutrition Can I have in the a bagel world. Bagel with butter, but hold the bagel. That's right, hold it's, the bagel. It's hold the fabulous. Bagel. Yeah. So it's really pretty fascinating, and I think that that uh, what what the implicit message is about the calories is that it's your fault you're fat. Like if you just ate less and exercise more, everything would be fine. Mm -mm. But even if you were the Guinness World Record holder in calorie counting, you couldn't control your food intake properly. Because it's like a bite of food a day, 100 calories a day, you're off for 30 years, 100 calories a day, you're gonna gain 20 pounds, right? right. right. So you kind of can't do it by calorie counting. Uh -uh. You have to do it by figuring out what the right information is, what the right quality of the food is. So if you focus on the quality of the composition, it makes a difference. And I don't know if you heard about that Biggest Loser article that came out in the New York Times. It was I a did. Big, it was a big deal. And everybody kind of went crazy about this article. It was the number one shared they article. They gained they it all back. And what happened was they took, they took 16 participants from the Biggest Loser. They 14 actually finished the study. They measured their metabolism before and after. They did the weight loss, and then they measured it six years later. And what they found was that when they lost weight, when they went from like 300 pounds to 200 pounds, yeah. their metabolism slowed down, right? That's not a surprise. One, because they were on a starvation diet, right? And when yeah. you're starving, your body naturally has mechanisms to slow down your metabolism. Yep. And two, when you lose weight, your metabolic rate's in directly related to your weight. So if your resting metabolic rate is 10 times your weight in pounds, if you weigh 300 pounds, your metabolic rate's 3,000. If it's 200 pounds, it's 2,000. So of course you're going to slow your metabolism yep. down. That's, that's the one fallacy with the study. The second is that when people gain their weight back, they weren't taught what to do. So they were all eating low fat diets, uh -huh. they were all starving themselves, and their bodies were in a state of starvation and low fat. Then they and went back to their real and life. They went back to their original weight and their metabolism was slower. When you, when, you gain, when you lose weight, you lose muscle and fat. When you gain weight, you gain back all fat. <laughs> so actually, of course, your muscle burns seven times as much as your fat, in calories, so of course you're going to have a slower metabolism, unless you do it right. Now, Dr. David Ludwig from Harvard did an amazing study where he took a group of guys and he, and he fed them different diets on different right. times. So there was the same group, so they would, it was called a crossover trial, so they would do one group, uh, sorry, the group would have one diet for yeah. three weeks and then another diet for three weeks and another diet for three weeks. Cool, and the first diet was low fat. Just low fat. 10% fat. 60% carbs. And the other diet was 60% fat and 20% carbs. Interesting. And when they looked at the data on this, was fat, and they were, remember, they were eating exactly the same calories. Right. Exactly the same calories. And they were their own control because it was the same people eating the different diets, right? Yeah. So it was a very well done study. That's yeah, cool. At the end of the study, they found that the ones who had the 60% fat diet burn 300 calories more a day than the low-fat group. So it means basically if you eat a high-fat diet, your metabolism speeds up 300 calories a day. That's like running an hour a day without getting off the couch. Did it matter what fats they had? I think it does. I think it does matter. I think if you have trans fats, if you have refined vegetable oils, it's a problem. And saturated you know, fats still Well, let's bad. You want to get into that? I, I want to get into that, You want to get into the saturated fat. So that's the weight loss thing. So it's really about how you eat fat. You speed up your metabolism, you cut your hunger, and you, you actually burn more fat, which right. is a good thing. Uh, and I, you know, I just uh, was, was, was uh, talking to Rick Warren, who's one of my patients, one of the uh, leader of Saddleback Church. Yes. And uh, we had his church lose a quarter million pounds in a year doing this approach. <laughs> I heard about this. And he, you know, he recently, I put him on a recently a ketogenic diet because he was really struggling. He's eating like 60 or 70 percent fat. He lost 45 pounds. He's never hungry. He looks amazing. His muscle mass has increased. So you actually see all the changes that are positive, opposite of what you think. You see people's blood pressure go down, their cholesterol get better, their weight and body fat improve, their muscle mass go up, their triglycerides go down, their HDL go up. It's really amazing. That is one healthy congregation because it was you and Daniel Amen together, right. wasn't it? That's right, that's right. The Daniel plan. Yeah, it wasn't named after him. It was named after Daniel from the Bible right. who resisted the king's temptation of rich that food. That is one healthy congregation, uh, man. They're, they're working on it. That's a lot of pounds, We right? got them off the big gulps and we got them off the you know, ice cream socials and the pancake breakfast. They were just trying to get their <laughs> congregation to heaven early, you know?
That's amazing. Yeah, and it's great. He you know, invited a Jewish doctor in there to you know, <laughs> preach health to the church. It was great. He wrote a book. It was like a, the number one bestseller. And I, I we'll called the Daniel Plan. I wanted to call it the Jewish Doctor's Guide for Christian <laughs> Wellness. <laughs> <laughs> nice Jewish doctor. All right. Um, so, so anyway, the saturated fat thing is quite interesting because um, yeah. we are still told by the government to eat less saturated fat. Mm -hmm. And I read my recent JAMA recently, it says we should eat less than 10% of our calories as saturated fat. Mm -hmm. uh, the good thing is the Dietary Guidelines reviewed all their data on fat, and they, yeah. they came out this year and they it said... It just changed. They changed. For the first time, they said, this is not just my opinion, they said, we no longer have to restrict total fat in our diet. This was since the first time since the guidelines came out in 1980, yeah. they eliminated any restriction on dietary fat. So basically, what they said was... We used to say reduce your fat to less than 20% or 30% of calories. Right. Now they're like, forget about it. Eat as much fat as you want. And by the way, we got it wrong on cholesterol too. Uh, we thought cholesterol was bad for you. The cholesterol raised your cholesterol and it caused heart disease. Right. But there really wasn't any proof and we kind of got that wrong. So it's no longer, <laughs> quote, a nutrient of concern. A nutrient of concern. I was going to say, it's no longer a, quote, nutrient of concern. I like that. So go ahead and eat your eggs and forget about the egg white eat omelet. Eat your eggs. Now, what about matzo ball soup as a fellow? Oh, no, uh, about that. That's not good. That, that, matzo ball is all starch. Right. Chicken soup is good. No, chicken soup. Hold the matzo hold ball. Hold the matzo ball. Hold the bagel. Hold the bagel. Exactly. Put a couple, put some coconut oil. <laughs> you know, it's exactly. In the, in the so, matzo ball soup. Exactly. Right. So, so the, the idea was that... Um, in this, in this recent guidelines, they yeah. still restricted saturated fat. And I think, you know, there's just so much inertia on this. And there's so much belief in the cholesterol theory of heart disease. And it kind of goes like this, right? It goes like this. In the 50s, there was this guy named Ansel Keys. And mm -hmm. he was a scientist who said, we should figure out if there's a correlation with something we're eating and heart disease. So he went around to all these different countries. There's World Health Organization data. And he picked seven countries for his study. Right. And he found a direct correlation with the amount of saturated fat and heart disease. Yeah. It's fascinating. But it was kind of shady science because there were 22 countries in total, and he left all of them out except seven. And when you looked at all the data, there was a whole bunch of countries that had high fat diets ah. that actually had very low heart disease. Cherry risk. picking countries there? Like France, like Spain, like ah. Switzerland, right? So these, oui, monsieur. Right. So <laughs> the whole French paradox, right? Right. Why do French eat butter and drink all this wine and eat cheese and don't get heart disease? And thin. They're like thin. thin. Right. Yeah. Why did that happen? So I think, I think he kind of ignored that. And it was also <laughs> was it clear that it seemed like cholesterol levels were associated with heart disease. So they, they actually found that saturated fat raises your LDL cholesterol, mm. which it does. Yeah. Right? But that was a very simplistic idea. Yeah. <clears throat> and unfortunately, LDL cholesterol is not the whole story. When you look at There's the more. actual heart disease... It's more complicated than that. We've become more sophisticated. First of all, it's not LDL that actually correlates. It's the total divided by the HDL cholesterol. You need which, the good cholesterol. Which is the good cholesterol. And that's governed by the amount of sugar you eat. And guess what raises HDL cholesterol? Fat. Saturated fat. Saturated fat? Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. And so that's an, an exercise. That's interesting. And the second thing that correlates is the triglyceride to HDL ratio. Mm -hmm. Triglycerides are controlled yeah. by what? By, f not fat, but by sugar. So That's sugar right. and starch raise triglycerides. So the mm, triglyceride ratio is much better. And the other thing is, not the only the LDL, but the size and shape and density of the LDL particles. Mm. So we used to think it was just LDL and HDL. Now we know there's different sizes of particles, so they actually... VDL, yeah, the others are a little... Well, there's, there's, there's actually now the ability to look at these cholesterol particles under an MRI machine. And you can see the LDL is comprised of really small, dense particles like golf balls or big, fluffy LDL particles like beach balls. Huh. The beach balls bounce off your arteries. They don't actually go in and cause cholesterol deposits. The small, dense ones do. Huh. And guess what raises the large, fluffy cholesterol? Beach balls. Saturated, Saturated fat. Saturated fat. Right. And guess what causes the small ones? Sugar, Sugar and starch. starch. Yes. Exactly. You were so, onto something with the no sh with the sugar solution. Yeah, we yeah. So I've been studying you know LDL particle size for 20 years. I asked the scientists on my fat summit, which I, I interviewed 30 experts on fat. Cool. We did this whole on on, on this course. It's available at fatsummit.com. You can listen to it. 30 experts. Everyone go to that on science. And this one doctor I interviewed was a scientist from Oakland the Children's Hospital. It's been the researcher Dr. Krauss on saturated fat, and he he basically said that he discovered this 40 years ago. 
I said, why is it still that doctors do not use this test? Like I've been using this test for 20 years and 40, and it's even at Cleveland Clinic now, there's still a small few doctors who actually use the particle size. We actually got it implemented there. Good. It was unbelievable. So <clears throat> what was his answer? His answer was, I don't know why people don't adopt. <laughs> I mean, it takes 20 years for scientific discoveries to be implemented. And I think we're going to see a change in the saturated fat. And recently, there's been a few studies that have also kind of poked some holes in the saturated fat theory. One is that higher levels of saturated fat were associated with lower risk of stroke, which is fascinating in meta-analysis. Mm -hmm. Another study, Dr. Mazafarian from Tufts, they looked at diabetes. And they found that those who had the highest levels of dairy fat, basically butter in your blood, <laughs> right? IV highest, butter. You know, the highest levels of dairy fat in their blood, and these were like 3,000 people over 15 years, yeah. had a 40 to 50% reduction in diabetes. <clears throat> Another study, and this was fascinating. Stack Doc, butter. Doctor, Bring us some butter, please. I'm not saying butter is a health food. I'm just saying it's not evil. Yeah. It's not, fat's not evil. evil. It's probably neutral, and it actually may have some benefits. But there are good fats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. there are. We'll get to those. Yeah. And so the other study that came out recently was just fascinating was, and I had breakfast with the, one of the researchers, Dr. Hiblin from the NIH, and he's this really smart, nice guy who's been quietly working in his lab for mm -hmm. you know, 30 years <laughs> studying fat. And he studied omega-6 fats and, ome and saturated fat. Right. And it, they found this research that was done by Dr. Ansel Keys and his colleague uh -huh. that was literally buried in a basement for 40 years because they didn't Dusted like the off. results. <laughs> Because the results they were... They buried that. They buried it. So what was fascinating was before we had ethical committees reviewing research, they right. did all kinds of studies. This was a study done in, in mental institutions. So they had 9,000 people, mental institutions, a couple of nursing homes, mm -hmm. and they basically had control of these people. Yeah. So they can control what they ate. So yeah. half of them got High saturated fat. Saturated half fat. of them got omega-6 vegetable oils. Now the whole Ooh. message has been eat more vegetable oil. Like Crisco. Eat less saturated fat. Less Not Crisco. Enough. Not what Crisco. Is saturated fat is, is you know, butter, but yeah. vegetable oils like corn oil, soybean oil. Yeah. Soybean yeah. oil is now 10% of our calories. It's in everything. Soybean oil. Yeah, you the see it everywhere. The two things that are everywhere are high fructose corn syrup and soybean oil. Yeah. And it's hydrogenated. It's plain soybean oil. And it's what's used in all our food now. Yeah. Because everything, vegetable oils are good. We took out coconut. We took out lard. We took out <laughs> all these foods that were bad for us. And we put bad all these vegetable. Right. Now, what they found in this study is 9,000 people. It was a controlled experiment, and they gave them either vegetable oil or they gave them butter and saturated fats. Oh my God. And they, guess what they found? That the people who had the saturated fats did better. They did better, right. And what <laughs> happened was that when they took the vegetable oil study, they, those people had the lowest LDLs. That's why I think vegetable oil is good, because it lowers your LDL. But the ones who lowered the LDL the most had the highest heart, risk of heart attacks and death. So even though the LDL came down, it was a bad kind of LDL. Yeah. It was oxidized LDL because the L The dense. It was the dense ones or it was oxidized because uh, omega-6s can oxidize very easily. They're unstable. Saturated fats are stable and uh, omega-6s are unstable. So they buried the data. They didn't publish it. And then the researchers knew that there was this guy's son, one of the, Dr. Key's colleague, and they found this guy and they said, hey, did your dad like have any data from this study? Because it wasn't all published. It was the Minnesota coronary experiment. It was a big study. Let's go to the basement and check. So he's like, yeah, yeah, oh, there's a box in the basement. <laughs> Seriously, there was a box in the basement. They pulled it out. They had all this data. They analyzed it. They just published it a few weeks ago. And a lot of people criticize it. They say, oh, well, it was, you know, they actually didn't do the study long enough that the, uh, you know, that, 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 that they didn't do it right, or they had all kinds of criticisms. But I talked to the researcher and he's like, look, we actually, he said, when you, when you see people with lower cholesterol, it's that they're sicker and they're not healthy, and so that's why they have lower LDL, and that's why they died. And he said, no, no, no we had people's weight. Because that's yeah, true, if you get cachectic, you know, cancer patients, yes. you're an oncologist, they get yes. low LDL because they're like cachectic yes. and they lose all their body yes. weight. <clears throat> but, but it's not but that they're healthy. No, he said, we actually had these people's weight. We had their body mass. It wasn't because they were sick or lost weight. And then we did autopsy studies and we saw what happened. So all the criticisms are really full of holes. And, and yet the, the establishment still won't accept the study. It's like, don't confuse me with the facts, my mind's made up. Yeah. I think the bottom line on saturated fat is that it's not the evil we thought it was. I think in the next dietary guidelines, we're gonna see revision of this. You can sort of put my little footnote in there and, and you'll see I'll be right in five years. Whoop. Yep, and then, and then. Hymenize it. <clears throat> that's right, and then um, the one caveat is no sweet fat. So if you eat 
fat or saturated fat in the context of sugar or starch, you're screwed. Got it. Right? So yeah. you have to eat a very low glycemic diet. Yeah, well, Wonder Bread has high fructose corn syrup in it. Yeah, right. Why do they put sugar in bread? I don't know. Oh. It's terrible. So you have to eat uh, in, a, in a context of a very low glycemic diet, which means very low levels of sugar, starches, you know, potatoes, rice, bread, pasta, all those things. I mean, bread has, a higher, glyce high, yeah, bread has a higher glycemic index than sugar. How about white rice? Like, you go, I love sushi. You know, sushi is like, you know, I would encourage you to unroll all your sushi and see how much rice there is and stick it in a bowl. You'll see actually how much rice you're eating with each sushi. Is rice, is, is sushi rice and like they put white, what, Wonder Bread? Yeah, and they it put is. sugar in the rice. They do. So have sashimi. Yeah, <laughs> sashimi. But no tuna because it's full of mercury. Yes, yeah. yes. Um, <laughs> yeah, I, I call Ariana Huffington the goddess of sleep. I have a new name for you, the guru of fat. Uh, well, I've, you know, I've got a lot of things I'm working on. I've done sugar, fat, I'm working on a new book on protein. Oh yeah? <clears throat> Tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Well, you know, I think it's the, it's the other You've heard it first here. <laughs> not all proteins are equal. No, 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 not all proteins are equal. That's true. I mean, animal and vegetable protein are quite different. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, as we get older, Keeping your muscle mass is critical. So when you look at all the disease of aging, mm -hmm. they're all related to insulin resistance. Yep. And when you lose muscle, you increase cortisol, the stress hormone, you decrease growth hormone, so you can't yeah. build and repair tissues. Yeah. You increase insulin resistance, your testosterone goes down, so you lower your sex hormone. So all these things happen as you lose muscle. Yeah. So it's a really critical, and I think the biggest disease of aging is what we call sarcopenia, which means loss of muscle. So you can have someone who's 65, and they can be the same weight as they were when they were 25 and be twice as fat. Yeah. Even though they look the same on the outside because they've lost muscle. I, uh, uh, you're a JJ skinny, Virgin calls me Tofi. You're a skinny fat guy? Yep. Thin, thin on the outside? Thin on the outside, fat, fat on, the on the inside. Yeah, that's right. I so I need, I need your fat guru-ness and your protein guru-ness yeah. because I got to build so, protein. So you need build, yeah, so muscle synthesis build is muscle, critical. I mean. So you need about 30 grams of protein about three times a day which is you know, about you know, three to four ounces, four ounces of protein. Yeah. And, and that can be a shake, it can be a piece of chicken, fish, yeah. meat, all those are really critical. Now I'm from Philly, so uh, <laughs> before I met my wife, I was eating cheesesteaks. Philly cheesesteaks? All the time, and I never knew what an avocado was. Right. Now I live in San Diego, and I'm eating avocados, I'm putting avocados on everything. That's good. What's the deal with avocados? I, is it one of the best foods one can eat? It's pretty good. You know, it's, it's got protein. It's got a lot of monounsaturated fats. Uh, it's got a lot of phytonutrients. that mm -hmm. are powerful anti-inflammatory compounds. And it's, uh, it's yummy. It's like everyone's hailing the avo. You can avo. make ice cream out of it. You can make, uh, put in smoothies. You can put in salads. And there's a big picture of an avocado on Eat Fat, Get Thin. Yeah, there is. It's good. Yeah. So it's a, that's a good one. Can we, can, we, can we throw out some other, like, what can people add so, to their so, diet? So, You're watching so this right now. What can they so add? So let me make it really simple. That's what this show's about, simple and loving. There's the good fat, the bad fat, and the ugly fat. Right? I love it. So the good fat is clearly everybody agrees on is omega-3 fats. That's wild fish, it's plant omega-3s like chia seeds, flax seeds, hemp seeds, uh, and you know, sardines are the best probably source of it. They're Those little, are, they, they don't sardines, eat other fish that have mercury. Herring, small mackerel, all that's great. So some of the old Jewish guys, give me my herring and my, <laughs> the, the white fish and the herring, they were onto something? They were onto something, exactly. So not all Jewish, <laughs> old Jewish guys are like eating no, the bad stuff. No, no, it's good, it's good. Lox, Get me my herring and lox, my pickled. My lox and egg sandwich, it's a lox and egg uh, omelet, that was my favorite. Dude, just hold the bagel. That's lox right, and the, eggs, okay, with a side of the uh, herring. Hold the bagel, Pickled exactly. herring? Exactly. Fermented, <laughs> <laughs> are yeah. you a fermented food guy? Uh, yeah, I think it can be great for people's gut flora, which is important. So okay. then there's, then there's uh, monounsaturated fats, which is olive oil. It should be extra virgin. Make sure it's not you know, extra mixed voyager. with other stuff, right? Yeah. And then um, nuts and seeds. Yeah. You know, not peanuts, yeah. but all the other nuts not and seeds. Not peanuts. Are, yeah. Macadamias, uh, I macadamias, hear, are especially good. Macadamias, almonds, walnuts, pecans, chia seeds, flax seeds. I wonder why macadamia seeds, nuts seeds. are more expensive. Oh, because they grow in Hawaii. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, so all those are all nuts good. are good. Nuts and seeds, olive oil, avocados, fish oil, those are all A+. Coconut oil? Coconut oil, this is the saturated fat conversation. Oh. 
So coconut oil is, butter is 60% saturated fat, and coconut oil is 90% saturated fat. But 90%. guess what, do you, know, do you know what the most abundant fat is in breast milk? Um, the saturated, saturated fat. fat. Breast milk is like, the, is, is like the mother nature's elixir. I mean, That's it's right. the... So why would nature put, or God, or whoever you believe in, put saturated fat in breast milk if it was bad for you? And it's the dominant fat. There's almost no other fat. And it's about 25% of calories. Oh my God. That's amazing. Pretty impressive, right? Yeah. So when you, when you actually look at breast milk, it's basically saturated fat. So we have to kind of not, I don't think as, as, a, as, a, as a society, we've gotten on this bad saturated fat wrap. Yeah. It's all about the LDL cholesterol, but it really, you know, when you eat saturated fat, it raises the fluffy ones. It does all kinds yeah. of other things. So I, I'm not so worried about it. <clears throat> and I think uh, for me, since I started eating saturated fat, my LDL has gone up, but the particle size has increased and my triglycerides have gone down, my HDL has gone way up. I mean, my, my HDL is now as good as when I was like 30, and I was running five miles a day. And I don't run five miles a day anymore. <laughs> I you know? can, I run like one of those 80 year old Jewish guys. <laughs> right. I, I look like that. Um, so, and then the, you know, the yeah. ugly fats you shouldn't eat are trans fat, which mm -hmm. I would just stay away from. It's in everything. Um, everything. The government has now ruled it is not safe to eat. So it's called a non-grass substance, meaning it's not generally recognized as safe. They've given the food companies a long runway to actually get this out of food. What's the number one trans fat that they put in everything? Is it it's like a... Soy, hydrogenated soybean oil. Hydrogenated yeah. soybean yeah, you oil. Can't, you can't actually look at the label of nutrition facts for that. You've got to read the label and see the word hydrogenated because they've got a trick where the food industry has gotten the FDA to allow them to say zero trans fat if it has less than half a gram per serving. So you really <sighs> want to not eat any of that. But it's still in there. It's still in there for a while. Like Cool Whip says zero trans fats on the nutrition facts label, but if you read it, it's all water, hydrogenated fat, and high fructose corn syrup. Oh my so God. So it's kind of tricky. And then omega-6 oils. Now this is, the, oh. this is the other controversy. Yeah. So the government and many food experts and scientists say vegetable oils are great. We should be all having huge amounts of vegetable oils. They lower LDL. Mm -hmm. They're associated with lower risk of heart disease. Right. And in some population studies, that's true. But there's some really cause for concern. One is that they actually oxidize easily. Mm. They uh, are highly refined, full of solvents like hexane, which actually cause leaky gut. Hexane? And, yeah, that's really? how they extract them. They deodorize them. They heat them. And they, they're very unstable oils. And they become rancid very easily. We use them in frying. So deep frying, you do not have fried foods. Because I say fat is good does not mean fried chicken is good. By the way, omega-6 fats are in chicken. Because chicken eat a lot of grains, which have omega-6 fats. In plain chicken, not just nuggets? No, not just nuggets, regular chicken. Because JJ I mean, right. said, what's wrong with chicken in your house? Because I'm like, I'm eating my kids' chicken nuggets. He said, just give them chicken. Yeah. But you're saying even chicken. Even chicken is a potential. I was talking to this researcher from the NIH. He's like, Mark, chicken is not that great because it's full of omega-6 fats. And by, the way, and by the way, they're now doing research on getting chickens omega-3s in their feed so they actually are, have a different profile of fat in the chicken. So they're starting to make the yeah. less omega-6 chicken. You can now get omega-3 eggs. It's another great source of fat. Yeah. You know, yeah. So, God, there's yeah. so many nuances. Yeah, there is. You know, but it's not eat. eat whole eggs that are organic. Yeah. Eat avocados. Eat nuts and seeds. Have extra virgin olive oil. Have a little coconut oil, a little grass-fed butter. And, uh, you know, by the way, you know, animal food, uh, that's a whole other topic. I think, you know, we can go into that if we have a minute. But I, We I, do. We do have a little, because you are, um, you're the best. I, I, I'm changing it. I'm just changing it into the food guru, because it's, <laughs> it's fats, it's proteins, it's sugar. It's all interrelated. It's not just no. change your fat, change no, your no. life. It's no, more no, it's than all, that. It's all of it. It's, you know, like it's, you said, every little bite's information. That's right. It's what protein? What sugar? Right. I mean, this is what people don't realize. If you, if you actually understand what food is, you change your relationship to it, right? If yes. you understood that food wasn't just energy, that actually it was instructions, like code, and you could upgrade your biological software or downgrade it with every bite, Ooh. you would reconsider what you're next doing. Next book, Recode Your Diet. That's right. That's your next book? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's After protein, after protein. It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's the quality and information in your food that matters. It's the phytonutrients. It's the quality of the fiber. It's the 
quality of the protein, the quality of the fat, the quality of the carbs. I mean, I say, you know, most of your diet should be carbs, by the way. By volume, most of your diet should be carbs. And what am I talking about? Yes. What are you like, talking like, about? What the heck are you doing? But well, I thought it was no carbs. No, it's not no carbs. It's not no carbs. It's the right carbs. Right carbs. Smart carbs, Healthy not carbs. dumb carbs, right? Yes. So guess what? Broccoli what? is a carb. Yes, and I love right? broccoli. Right? Thank you your for making it. Your asparagus are a carb. Love asparagus. Right. So yeah. your, your salad vegetables are all Those are carbs. carbs. Right. Yeah, so healthy carbs. most of your diet should be non-starchy vegetables. Non by volume. Yeah. So when you look at my plate. Yes, what does I've it look like, like? I've got like this huge pile Visualize of this. unlimited refills of non-starchy veggies. Eat as much as you want. So I, I could eat a whole head of cauliflower, yeah. and I'm going to get full on that. Yeah. It's, I mean, how much broccoli can you eat? You can't eat 20 cups of broccoli, right? Make the mashed potatoes out of cauliflower. That's right. I you make know, cauliflower those little, those little You can make cauliflower rice, cauliflower mashed potatoes. Those switches. It's really great, exactly. And so uh, that's the most of my plate by volume, by calories. And eat most, as much as you want. As much as you want. By calories. Right, right. I mean, you, and the thing is, fat, you can't eat that much fat. I mean, by volume. I, can you eat 12 avocados? No. No. But you can one eat 12 cookies. Uh huh. Right? Because I eat one and I'm like, you could eat a pint of ice cream. the whole sleeve of those thin mints. Like, right. I, I've been, in, in 10 years ago, I ate a sleeve. Yeah, I used to eat one to, sitting. Yes, I used to eat like a pint of ice cream. Easy. Maybe two. <laughs> okay, so, but do you think it's as much as you want yeah. of the vegetables? Yeah, as much and as you then want. what is it by calories? And then by calories, you know, there's not a lot of calories in that. So by calories, most of your diet is fat. Right? Yeah. Because they're very, it's very calorie dense. So you're yeah. eating olive oil, nuts and seeds, avocados. Good fats. So put some uh, sunflower seeds on the exactly instead Pumpkin, of the croutons. Like, right, pumpkins. I like toasted pumpkin seeds. They're, They're great. good for the prostate. That's great. They are pumpkin Zinc seeds. And, right. Now, I think. Now, tell me what you think about this. I think the best anti-cancer diet is the same exact diet as anti-inflammatory diet. It I is. Think it's anti-inflammatory. And by the way, you know this, but when they do a PET scan, what do they give you? Sugar, radioactive deoxyglucose, right. FDG. Radioactive labeled sugar. Why? Why am I doing? Why am I giving why, them? Why that? are you giving them sugar? Because, because the cancer loves the cancer. the cancer loves sugar, and it lights up. Boom! Right. So boom. boom that's the cancer. Right. And we know clearly that increased starches and carbs and sugar increase cancer risk. We know. You know what they say? Don't eat carbs before your PET scan. Right. Because <laughs> we're gonna. It's gonna throw it off. Exactly. Right. Right. It's crazy. Right, exactly. So doc, they, people don't even think about this. But they go, when you're a cancer doc, they go, oh, just eat whatever you want. Have ice cream. No, do don't not lose eat whatever weight, you want. Eat, whatever, eat tons of bread. Eat starch. Like, that is the worst advice. We give them Ensure Plus. And then they go, and then they go well, don't eat tofu because it causes breast cancer, which is nonsense. When you look at the research no. on this, yes, processed soy is bad for you yes. and causes cancer. Which but is not like, a whole organic tofu. No. Right, exactly. So yeah. I think I think or it's, edamame. Right, exactly. So it's like it's crazy, and I, I think the uh, the whole issue of meat is also concerning because everybody's like, well, should I be a vegan? Should I be? This is coming up in the next book. Paleo. Yeah. What's? Can we get a little? Uh... Well, I talk about it in this book. I, I talk about the pegan diet because pegan. Yeah, because I was I was sitting on a panel like with that. a couple of friends of mine, uh, Dr. Joe Khan, who's a cardiologist, a vegan. He's a friend. Hey, Joel. And good guy. Hi, Joel. Yeah. And then uh, my other friend, Frank Lippman, who's a paleo doc, and like, yeah. I'm in the middle, I'm like, wow, this is like crazy. I must be a pegan if you're a paleo <laughs> vegan. And then I just thought about it, I'm like, you know, pegan. it makes sense because it's not excluding anything, but it's having the right amounts of the right things. Tell me just a teeny bit more about pegan. Like, like so the idea, are you a pegan? I'm a pegan. So I eat, I eat some beans and grains, but not a lot. I eat some meat, but not a lot. And I eat mostly plant foods. So I don't exclude anything, but I include them in the right proportions. Yes, grass And I get fed. rid of all processed food. I get rid of all refined foods. Yeah. I try not to buy anything in a package or a can or a box. And, uh, you know, I eat only things I recognize as whole food. I mean, listen, you know, if something has an ingredient list mm -hmm. or nutrition facts label or, you know, uh, a barcode, it probably isn't real food, right? No. I mean, an avocado doesn't have a nutrition facts a label. Right? No. An egg doesn't have an ingredient list. <laughs> right? Almonds don't have a barcode. No. Right? They're just food. They're just, you recognize, oh, this is food. Like, or, right? yeah, yeah, like coloring, purple number five. I mean, I, I have a slide in one of my presentations. It's of this, uh, this list of ingredients. Yeah. And I said, anybody can tell me what this food is, I'll give you $1,000. <laughs> it's just ingredients. It's just ingredients. No one can tell what it is. Nobody knows. Name this food. It's some processed 
cakey thing that I'm not going to say, <laughs> but it's like nobody knows. Yeah. It's like this, and it's the same crap they put in everything. So I, I really love the idea of pig. And it's great. So the meat whole thing, I, and I, I took a deep dive in this because I'm like, well, geez, I don't want to eat meat if it's going to kill me. Yes, please right? share. I, I don't want to, uh, I want to live to be 120 years food. old. Yes. I'm like, what is the story? You know, you look at the, the, the uh, yeah. plains. Gra that, grass fed beef. Yeah, That's I mean, you look thing. at the Plains Indians, and they, they were hunting, eating buffalo. It was like most of their diet was buffalo. Yeah. And they had the highest per capita centenarians in history. So they had people yeah. living to 100 like crazy, and they were all mm -hmm. they were eating was buffalo. And, and that's uh, it. And you know, a few little nuts and seeds. And, and God bless them, they would use every part of the buffalo. Exactly. Yeah. And then you know, you've got the you've got the other hand. You've got the the blue zones, and you've got Loma Linda, California, which is where they're all vegetarian, the Seventh Day Adventists, and they're living to be a hundred. So like, what gives, right? That's not what too is, far. Yeah. Not too far, right? So I was like, what is the story here? And yeah. I thought, you know, let's look at the data. And you kind of look at most of the data, and it's crappy data. Uh huh. Crappy data because it's what we call population studies, epidemiology. Yep. I Means like they go. Okay, let's like follow this group of people for 30 years and let's ask them every year a food frequency questionnaire. What yeah. did you eat last week? Do you know what you had for lunch last Thursday? Uh, no. Okay, right. So I think Probably I'll, something fried. Right, right. And, they go, <laughs> and they go, you know, what did you eat? And they're like, by the way, uh, if meat is seen to be bad in the culture, people aren't eating meat who want to be healthy. Right. Right. So there's a healthy user effect. Or at effect. least not admitting to it. <laughs> and the meat eaters are the people who don't really care about their health. Mm -hmm. So they're like eating more crap. So yeah. if you look at the meat eaters in those population studies, they ate 800 more calories a day. They were more overweight. They exercised less. They smoked more. They drank more. They ate less fruits and vegetables. They had less, uh, uh, you know, they had more sugar and fried foods. And they, they didn't take any vitamins. So of course they had more heart disease. Oh my God. And you look at other data when they, when they actually find that there isn't a correlation, it's, it's interesting. So there's not, it's not black and white with the observation. And then they actually did a study, which I love, which is they took 11,000 people who shopped at health food stores. So if you're a meat eater who buys grass-fed meat and you shop at Whole Foods, yeah. what, what is your risk? So they actually did Probably. that, they did that study. They found that they looked at meat eaters who shopped at health food stores and vegetarians who shopped at health food stores. And they both had their risk and death cut in half. There both. was no difference. No difference. No difference. And then you look at interventional studies where yeah. you actually feed people a paleo diet. Yes. Which is, they use animal food, but there are a lot of vegetables, yeah. no sugar, very low sugar diets. Yeah. And all their biology gets better. Their diabetes goes away, their blood sugar gets better, their blood pressure gets better, their cholesterol gets better, their body weight goes down, their muscle mass goes up, yeah, people their are always inflammation asking goes down, their oxidative stress goes down. I'm like, Okay, well that's interesting. Yeah. That's an experimental study. So I, I find those very compelling because they're actually giving the people and seeing what happens, a healthy diet. It's not like meat in the context of like French fries and so Coke and like, yeah. yeah. Meat in the context of all you can eat broccoli right. with a side of avo and some right. pumpkin seeds. Right, and then the quality of the meat matters, right? So if you're eating a lot of chicken, it may not be a good thing. But if you're eating- Omega-6 om chicken. Right, if you're eating omega-3 chicken, it might be okay. And if you're eating uh, grass-fed beef, it has higher levels of omega-3 fats. It has more antioxidants, more minerals and nutrients. It's generally better for you. It's got less hormones, antibiotics, pesticides, and other things that might be bad for you. So I, I think after I looked at all the data, you know, and, there, and there's a couple issues. One is, yeah. you know, moral, right? So if you, yeah. if you are morally opposed to eating meat, that's fine. Yeah. I don't have a problem. I have Buddhist monks as patients. Of course, me too. I don't force too. them to eat no. meat. Um, but I think, you know, there, the ethical issues have to be, you know, be a little more transparent because, yeah. you know, I was, I was visiting the Brooklyn Grange, which is the largest rooftop organic farm in the country in cool. Brooklyn. And we're going around, I'm thinking, well, how do you like get the soil and what do you do and how do you grow these vegetables? Yeah. I go, oh, we put bone meal on the soil. We put oyster shells <laughs> on the broth. soil. Bone broth. <laughs> Not bone broth, bone meal. They grind up bones because of right. the nutrients in the bones. That's so cool. basically, your broccoli is a carnivore. Yeah. Right? People who are vegetarians. <laughs> your broccoli is a carnivore. Yeah. People it's are, using it to grow. Right. People who are, who are vegetarians don't realize that you're killing animals to actually grow your vegetables. And then when you <laughs> look at agriculture as an enterprise, it's inherently destructive. Right? It's inherently destructive. You're killing the habitat of animals. You're killing small rodents and birds and insects and all kinds to of stuff. To grow all the veggies. To grow the veggies. So you can't get away from oh the fact that we're killing other things. And then there's a whole, it's more there's complicated, a whole body of science on the feelings of plants. Plants actually have feelings. Oh 
Well, I want to and, get into that. Yeah. So there's a whole body of research looking at, and I just was reading some about it. It's fascinating. So I, I think, mean, a tree is just the most yeah. gorgeous thing ever in That's the world. Right. And so I, I think people who like, are uh, morally on high ground about it, I think they need to look at the facts. The second thing is um, environment. Now, grass-fed versus feedlot beef, there's no question that factory farming is destructive to the environment. It depletes our aquifers. It puts fertilizer and, and, uh, and pesticides into the waterways through runoff that destroy our waterways. It depletes our soils. It creates climate change through methane in the way we grow these animals. And, it, and it's inherently destructive, and it uses one-fifth of all fossil fuels. So it's really a bad enterprise. Yeah. Plus, the use of antibiotics leads to superbugs, yeah. which you probably see. Oh, yeah. And so we basically have a bad ecological disaster by factory farming. But yeah. grass-fed is very different. In fact, there's guys like Alan Savior talking about restorative agriculture, restorative grazing that actually can sequester more carbon than it puts in the environment. In fact, he says if we adopt this at wide scale, we may be able to take our climate back to pre-industrial age by sequestering all this carbon through increasing grasslands. So it's, it's a whole different increasing body. Increasing grasslands with yeah. grazing buffalo. Yeah, so we have to deal with the environmental issues. We have to deal with the the health issues. But I, I, I think the net net on this is that if you eat you know, small to moderate amounts of grass-fed meats or healthy protein from yeah. animals, it's actually not bad for your health, yeah. it's probably good for your health. You know another thing I love about you? You take everything into consideration. It's not, this is right, this is wrong. It's like, let's really look at the data. Yeah. Let's tease through it. Let's go to someone's basement and dust it off. Let, I mean, well, you have to, and I've been attacked. Since, I mean, I, everybody really, up to now, nobody's really attacked me, right? And now I'm getting all these attacks, and there's the low fat vegans coming out of the closet. Stop attacking. Uh, you know, it's like, I, I mean, the, 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 whole, the story is just so fascinating. I mean, even the vegans do studies looking at high fat veganism is healthier than low fat veganism because it causes more weight loss and better lipid profiles and so on. So I think we really have to be honest about what we're seeing and not just. I mean, I don't, listen, I haven't spent my life promoting one particular theory. In fact, things I say now contradict things I said before, because as I learn more, my earlier books, I was saying saturated fat was bad. We're always changing. So as I look at the data, I have to change my point of view. I, I, I once read the Dalai Lama, I was reading uh, one of the books on science. He says, look, if science proves my Buddhist beliefs wrong, I'm going to have to change my beliefs. That's brilliant. Right? Yeah. yeah. So I think, but now in science, people have spent their whole career proving vegetable oil is good, or proving yeah. low fat is bad, or proving some perspective that is actually wrong, yeah. and it's hard to change degrees on that. Well, I think we have to stay open. I mean, I'm, I, I consider myself a boo so we're open to <laughs> all things, and always changing, always yeah. getting better, yeah. and we're always a, a work in progress. Exactly. I mean, even the food guru, that's amazing. I want to thank you for being here today. My pleasure. I can't, um, I can't get over how uh, amazing you are as a guest, as an author, just as a human being. Thank you. And uh, thanks for being here. Uh, and special shout out to um, ultrawellnesscenter.com, drhyman.com for more of Dr. Hyman's programs. Thanks for being here on the Dr. Stephen Show. We will see you all next week. Thank you and bye. Guys, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thumbs up. I love you. We'll see you on the next show. Woo!